So our first talker today is actually an old colleague of mine. <coughs> not, no, I mean, uh, not old, but uh, 11 years ago we worked together at Google. And uh, Thomas Baring is here from Google. He's still working for Google. And uh, come on up. You're going to talk about rethink measurement for growth, right? Yes. Yes, yes. that was the plan. And um, I wanted to ask you, Thomas, what was the last thing you Googled, actually? No, sorry, you watched on YouTube. Uh, well, it's actually both. Um, I have a four and a half year old who's particularly interested in all animals and also dinosaurs. So we had to find out what a Critoxorino was, oh. which is a very large prehistoric shark from the Cretaceous period. And did you find something exciting? Of course. Well, yeah, it, it's lar <laughs> it was larger than a great white. She's, she's very scientifically minded, so she's actually interested in the facts about it. Don't know oh, the pictures and all that, but it, no, look, oh, there it is. Okay, it's interesting. From Cret Cret she was teaching me about the three dinosaur periods the other day. Oh, there's a Cretaceous and the Jurassic and the Triassic. She was sort of after me for not getting in the right order. So your four and a half year old is teaching you more than Google almost. But yeah, well, yes, she's, she's they encouraging. Are the future, she's aren't in, they? She's in, well, hopefully. <laughs> So anyway, I think we should give Thomas a great round of applause, and uh, we look forward to listening. Oh, ah, play. Stupid Max. Oh, sorry, this is on. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really do Max big. Also, as a Dane, being invited to the slaughterhouse in Sweden feels a bit um, awkward. Um, but let's live in the now. Again, I, I suppose thank you for, for inviting me here. Um, I work for Google still. I've worked there for, for almost 13 years. Google continues to want to be this very successful company. We mainly so far live on marketing. The only way we're going to continue to be successful is if you guys continue to be successful. Can we turn this ever so slightly down? I feel like I'm very, very loud in here. I just can't speak much lower than I'm already speaking because that just gets awkward as well and kind of creepy in a slaughterhouse. Yeah, I think that's better. Thank you. Perfect. Um, for us, as I say, to continue to be successful, you guys need to be successful as well. For you to continue to be successful, we need to be agreeing on what the things we're looking at are. So hence our idea of saying, well, what do successful companies actually do? And how can we help you guys become even more like them? So we did an analysis on the actual financial results of a large number of companies, and we looked at the ones who were sort of the mainstream ones, so sort of more or less meeting their targets, and then the ones who were significantly exceeding their targets from a financial point of view. So again, remember, this has nothing to do with marketing. But what we found in this exercise was that three quarters of the elite companies had actually changed their approach to how they measure the outcomes, for instance, of their marketing within the last two years, whereas it was only one third of the mainstream. So this led us sort of to this idea that maybe we need to rethink measurement in order to be enabling growth in companies. We've sort of tried through interviews and discussions with all these different types of customers to narrow it down into three different areas That's, that seem to make sense. And these are what I would like to be speaking to you today about. It's about focusing on customer value. It's about treating the segments differently. And it's about prioritizing experience. Hopefully none of this will be particularly revolutionary to you, but hopefully it will give you some ideas and some insights and some thoughts into how to thinking about it differently. And if nothing else, how to be actually activating it within your companies. For the last part, one of my experiments is actually in here, so I'll get you all to stand up and sort of get you engaged, but it's still before 9 o'clock. I actually had a, an edict once that no one should be forced to look at PowerPoint slides before 9 o'clock in the morning, so sorry for that. I couldn't, couldn't keep all this microphone talk and everything going for that long. But anyway, focusing on customer value. So again, customer value is about valuing customers not just counting them, not just saying, oh, we've gotten this many clicks. The problem with online marketing is we've dug ourselves a hole of metrics. We've introduced a million different metrics. We've sort of prided ourselves as a business on being able to say, oh, yeah, all that offline and TV and everything, you can't measure that for shit. But look at us. You can measure CPTs, CTRs, CPAs, impressions, CPMs, whatever you want, we can measure it for you. But what that means is that then people will pick their favorite metric and start looking at that. 
And it's not always the right one, it's not always a meaningful one, as again, not to keep referring to my age, but I've been around long enough that 10, 11 years ago when I had AdWords discussions, it was very much about saying, oh, with conversion tracking, you can see exactly which keyword led to which conversion, and then you can get rid of all the rest of them. And then a few years later, we realized, oh, actually, there's all this whole generics and there's a search process. And then a few years later, bloody smartphones came along, and all of a sudden, oh, we don't quite have control of the cookie lifetime and all of these different things. So all of a sudden, it was really complex, and everything I'd been telling people was actually wrong. So let me start off with this. Which of these lines is longer? Yeah, trick question, isn't it? Because you're going to say, oh, they're both equally long. Actually, they're not. Uh, you've just been primed to think they are, but I've actually hacked this picture deliberately to prove a point, because you'll notice that the top one is actually slightly shorter. How does this relate to you? It relates to you because if we start talking about something like CPAs, you'll say, oh, we just want a CPA of, say, 150 Swedish kroner. But if one of these CPAs leads to a customer lifetime value of 140, then you're losing 10 kroner on every single one of those customers, which is leading your business straight to hell, roughly speaking, or bankruptcy, and they're pretty much the same. The other one might have a customer lifetime of 160, which means that every time you get one of these in, you're earning 10 kroner off of every one of these customers. The difference isn't much. It's probably a bit more than what I've denoted there, but what the hell, who's counting? But the point is, if you insist on cutting everything over the same comb, as you say in Danish, then you might be losing out on the details. If you're not actually looking at what the customer lifetime value is, but fixating on this one metric, which might be CPA, then you're potentially losing out on the actual value that customer is driving to you. I wager many of you have had discussions with either CMOs or customers, if you're an agency or whatever, saying, oh, I got this one click, which was 100 kroner, and I don't understand why, and that's completely ridiculous. The discussion should be, well, what did that lead to? If that led to a customer buying for 200 kroner, why aren't you happy that you got that 100 kroner click? If it led to someone buying for 50, let's find out how, we ne how that never, ever happens again. What we see from some of these analysis is that the leading marketeers are, as it says, one and a half, you can pretty much read the slides. Again, I assume if you can speak English, you can also read English, so I won't make too much of an effort to read this. But they're much more likely to use customer lifetime value, for instance, as a metric of success. Tied to that closely, they're three times more likely to actually tie their marketing to business objectives. Go to I'm making this number up, but about, I'm going to say about 70% of any CMOs in the world and ask them what the profit margins on their products are, and they will say they have no clue. I was relating over breakfast an anecdote of a customer I met with in Denmark a few years ago who was saying, oh, our CPA on mobile is far too high. Okay, well, you have a product that which you would largely be selling offline, so how are you measuring that? How are you taking that into account? To which I was told by the head of digital marketing, that's not one of my KPIs, so I don't care. Well, then again, we're not talking about the same thing. And I can't help you. I can't magically make your CPA go down because people are still not going to buy it here. They're going to buy it somewhere else. These types of discussions are crucial to have. And then finally, on that point, more and more we're seeing this gap between because you can set up a CPA target, doesn't mean you're setting the right one up. If you're making a profit of 100 Swedish kroner per sale, then what's the point of having a, a CPA target of 20, for instance? Sure, it'll give you higher ROI, but look at all the customers you're losing. What about that customer you could get for 80 Swedish kroner? You're still earning 20 Swedish kroner off them, but because you want a higher ROI, you're insisting on saying, oh, we have, we're at 20 now. If you can get that down to 18, that would be great. Yes, if I look like Brad Pitt, I'd have a successful movie career. Instead, I'm in front of 150 people in Malmö. That doesn't mean I made the wrong decision. It means that... Some people like Brad Pitt better. Fucker. We can edit that part out, right? Good. Yep, yeah, perfect. I feel like I'm in a talk show. It's kind of fun. An example of... I've always wanted to say that, actually, when I'm in grammar. We can edit that out, right? Which, so I got that out of my system. A case study here from Sweden, actually, on someone who did this, to some extent, is, is Smarta, who I'm sure you'll all be familiar with. They had, for a long time, set a target around how many leads they got in. Seems like it makes sense. I'm sure a lot of you guys are working off the same type of idea. But what they realized in discussion was, well, actually, we don't earn money until that application has actually been approved back from the credit lending agencies. 
huh, what if we actually measure off of that instead and try to get those customers in? Well, their revenue increased by 111%, but their ROI actually grew by 59%. So A, they're spending more, but they're actually getting more out. Now we are discussing how much we earn. If that's the conversation you're having with the people supplying you with money to spend on any form of marketing, then you're having the right discussion. If the discussion you're having with the people giving you money is how can we spend more of this money, then you're having the wrong discussion. Think about the difference between going to your bank and saying, here's a hundred of my hard-earned kroner. Many times a bank will say, thank you, we'll make sure we make money. Imagine if you went into a bank and said, here's a hundred kroner of my hard-earned, and they'll say, we'll make sure you make money, and then we'll take a cut off of that. That is what you want from a bank. That is what you should want from your marketing, because your marketing is basically your investment. So the summary of the first part is, do you know the value of your segments? This is not an exact science. I'll get into that in a bit. This is not exact, but if you're not thinking along these lines, then you're definitely doing the wrong thing about it, because that doing nothing is, by default, the wrong thing. Doing something, even if it turns out to be wrong, is the right thing. So now, point two, it's about treating the segments differently. Once, because there's no, there's no average customer. Average makes no sense. Average is the stupidest thing to say in the world. Average is walking down bloody Copenhagen Main Street and seeing every single hipster in the world dressing exactly the same, thinking they're unique. I don't like Danish hipsters either. That's a Another side point there. One of the problems in AdWords is that these numbers from, from search engine land, so this is completely third-party research, is when they looked at something like shopping, you'll notice that people would click on one product, and 64% of them would buy from the same designer, at least. Only 34% would actually buy the product they clicked on. And 36% would buy from a different designer, maybe not even the same type of product. So you're clicking on Adidas shoes, because obviously you have no sense of anything, but you end up buying Nike, which is much cooler personal opinion. How do you factor that in? If you're only responsible for, for this side of the business, you'll say, oh, we have 100 clicks on our Nike or on our Adidas shoes. And then someone sat there going, well, we only sold 34 of them, but those two people might never speak. When in fact, you're saying, well, all right, we've sold all these different things, so how is that ever going to tie out? Well, what we find is, if you start using things like behavioral insights, you get significantly more growth significantly more margin because you're able to smartly work out, well, actually, we do sell all of the Adidas shoes between 9 and 11 in the morning because that's where people want that. But then Saturday afternoons, most of the sales, even though they're on, clicked on this, actually end up buying that. Again, it's not an easy, simple, it's not a cheap insight, but it's something, if you work it out, the value in, un in understanding that is significant for the business. A really fun case, and apologies if some of you have seen this, because I've actually used this a million times, because it's genuinely one of my favorite case studies, which also maybe shows why I'm not Brad Pitt, because I'm not sure he gets excited about how mobile micro moments impact business results. But then again, that's why he's not invited to be here. <laughs> I bet you didn't, in did, or did you? No, yeah, there you go, see. <clears throat> so there's this hotel chain in the States, Red Roof Inn. They realize they're not Hilton, they're not any of these other big hotel chains, but what they do have is a large number of hotels near a lot of airports. Huh. So one winter there's a lot of snowstorms and everything, and they realize, well, actually, there's a lot of flights being canceled, which is a business opportunity, should be a business opportunity. And actually, when they start dug into a bit more, they realize that 3 to 4 percent, I think it is, of all flights in the States were actually canceled on a daily basis due to some reason. Now, the only thing I would rager any of you who travel any amount, the only thing you do not do is to book a hotel at the airport you're leaving from just in case your flight is canceled. Said no one ever. So they realized, well, actually, there's a moment there. There's a moment that no one else is capturing. So they actually built their own flight tracking software, enabled, say, to Chicago O'Hare Airport, that the second a flight, a long distance flight, was canceled in Chicago O'Hare Airport, their AdWords impression, or their, their CPC on AdWords, or Mac CPC on AdWords, would increase significantly to be top of booking at the moment someone searched for a hotel near Chicago O'Hare Airport. That led to a 266% increase in non-brand mobile bookings. That is a significant number, ladies and gentlemen. Non-brand, how much is a non-brand mobile booking worth? 
Hotels near Chicago O'Hare Airport, only at the very moment someone is searching for it and needs it. That is a brilliant example of understanding there's this data set, seems to indicate this need will provide this result. Excellent thinking. Was it cheap? Was it free? Was it simple? No, it probably wasn't. I have no idea how much it costs to build a flight tracking software, but once it's running, it's running. And so just make it sort of, sort of just throw in a little insertion, you'll notice the fonts and layout is completely different, but I just want to make it in. Leaders are also three times as likely to agree that there's always going to be something missing in the data, and this is something else we need to get through. It ties up to my last part, but this is something we need to get in the mindset of everyone. Is there the only time you can say 100% that something is a fact is after it's happened? René Descartes, Cogito ergo sum, um, David Hume, cause and effect, all these different things. We assume that the billiard ball will move when another one hits it because that's sort of how we're primed to think, but it's never given. Quantum mechanics says things might not necessarily happen or are in this void or whatever. As long as you insist on knowing exactly the outcome, you will only know exactly the outcome after you're done. No one expected Iceland to reach the qualifiers. They probably will. No one wanted Sweden to beat Denmark for the European qualifiers. They probably did. Stupid. Sorry. All of these different things, if you continue to insist on having 100% certainty of the facts, you will only have that after it's happened. If you accept that there might be some room I'm never saying bet your entire business. If you're 10% sure, that's not enough. But if you're 99% sure, it's probably too late. If you're 100% sure, it's after the fact. That's the only way you can be 100% sure. Find out what your threshold is. But the bottom line is, which customer insights might you already even have within the company you're working for? Which silo, which team somewhere sits in with, is it your customer databases? Is it your newsletter signups? Is it your, maybe even in some companies, the analytics department doesn't speak to the marketing department. Is it the creative agency you're working with who don't know which language is the best performing in your AdWords ads, which might help them to actually create better creatives and thereby use your money more efficiently? Find those silos and start to unlock them to enable the best possible marketing across your entire business. And then finally, it's about experimenting. Let's be honest, this is also what makes our lives a hell of a lot more fun. If everything was just a bland, here's a spreadsheet, come in, fill it out, go home, come in next day, here's a spreadsheet, fill it out, that's not fun. Might be for some people. To me, it's not fun. Booking. They have a thousand A-B tests per day. In Facebook, there's a 99% likelihood that you are in 10 A-B tests at any given time. We do about 20,000 A-B tests a year. We are now going to do one here, which could be fun. So, the way this exercise is going to work, Howard, oh geez, we're doing fine for time. The way this exercise is going to work is I'm going to have all of you stand up in a minute, not in a minute, in a few, when I'm done explaining this, you get the idea. Then there will be two different screens on stage. They're from a mobile site. I will ask you to put your hand up if you think the left one, it will always be the left one, just to avoid any, any biases or anything. If you think the left one is better performing than, than the right one. If you are correct, I'll ask you to remain standing. If you're incorrect, I'll ask you to sit down. Once you're sitting down, you can still participate in your mind, but you're basically out of the game. Does everyone understand the rules? Pretty much good. I've done this in, in rooms about this size, I have four A-B tests. I've generally ended up with between zero and one person left standing. Just saying. So, here is the first example. Everyone, please stand up now. Ah, yes, there's also, I hadn't really thought of the fact there's all different sizes of people here. Welcome to the tall Nordics. Um, sorry, shorter people down back. So, very first example here. Which of the, please put your hand up if you think this version where you have the blue buttons here worked better than this version here with the orange buttons. Put your hand up. 
All right, everyone with their hand up, please sit down. This version with the orange buttons had 7.8% more conversions. Now, hold off on your comments, since I have a few comments to make it towards at the end of this. Hold off with them for now. That was the first group. Second show here is, put your hand up if you think the left version here with the image of the menu points down here work better than the one to the right here with the text. Hand up if you think the left version worked better. Everyone with your hand up, please sit down. The interesting thing here is, and Maria almost gave away my point here, is the bounce rate, so the conversion rate you'll find is the same. The bounce rate here was ever so slightly higher, probably because these images took longer to load. So that little difference in speed load time actually meant that more people preferred this. They got what they were looking for sooner, possibly. The next example is from Facebook. I unfortunately don't have numbers here. All we can see is they went with one of these options um, afterwards. So I'll tell you which one, which one won, because we can observe that behavior. So you have the left example here with um, uh, description lines under the icons, and the right version here without description lines. So put your hand up if you think the left version was the best. And everyone with your hand up, please sit down. Yeah, oh yeah, I forgot to put the animation in. So we can see that this is what they went with. The rationale we were able to find when we spoke to UX people is that because people know, are so familiar with Facebook, they don't even need these reminders. Again, that's just noise on the screen. So the more they can cut out the clutter, the cleaner they can make it, the more people prefer it. So we have two, four, six, some people. I don't have prizes anyway, so I mean, it's not like you're all stood here, yeah. It's Google, you use our products for free. What else do you want? Last example here, and this is, this is from PPC traffic. So which of these perform better? The version here, which uh, this, the, this version is a, is a text version. This is a mobile site specific version. So put your hand up if you believe the left version worked best. Everyone with your hand up, remain standing. Two hundred and fifty-six. Let me no, just stay up for a bit because you were right as well. Let me just count. All right, so we're at six. Uh, are you guys sort of still in there? Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. So yeah, you can't really work, work it out. Six, seven people. Slightly more than I normally have. Let's give these six people a round of applause. Actually, <laughs> this one had two hundred and fifty-six. Again, the rationale here is because it's specifically PPC traffic, people are probably more interested, so they don't, they don't care about the nice layout. They actually care about just ensuring that they're actually finding what they're looking for. The point of this is not to say, make orange buttons, don't use images in anything, um, be Facebook, whatever. The point is to say, if you're not testing, you will never know. Maybe for your website, blue is better than orange. Maybe text under your, uh, your, your images is better. But you don't know unless you try it. If you work in an organization that insists on having 100% clarity and having a one-year build cycle on their products, you miss that testing period to find out whether or not you're actually making the right decision or you're making what you feel is a gut-informed decision. So yes, only 30% actually have an impact, but that means the other 70 might be negative or neutral. So there's actually a 70% likelihood if you just spend a year building a new website or creating a new campaign or whatever it is, that it won't do any better than the old one. But you won't know unless you test. So the answer or the question to ask yourselves is, do you have a process to experiments and across the full customer journey? We talk a lot about marketing, we talk to websites, we've talked analytics, all of these different things. Help the customer all the way through. Build a process, make sure you're finding out. That requires basically that you know what is our customer value? What is it we're earning from these companies? How is that tying into our market objectives? Are we treating them differently in the best way possible? If we know someone is interested in one thing, are we making it as easy for them as possible to get that one thing? Or are we forcing them to go down the route of everyone else? And finally, we will never know these things unless we experiment, because there is no final answer. There is a constant test process. But that was it for me.